tell us how you're going at the moment, Joe. Oh, we're, we're, we're progressing very well. We've got a, a project we want to come into production with. We've just delivered a second of a series of feasibility studies and we're very heartened by what we've, what we've uncovered. We're also very heartened by the long-term prospects for Cobalt. Joe, so tell me, how important is the De Democratic Republic of Congo in all this and how important it is for your company and how <coughs> salient it's been, I suppose, in what's been going on with the Cobalt Prize, which I'll talk about in a second. Yeah, look, I think the, the sheer uh, scale of the Congonese production as a percentage of global uh, production is, is dominant. So at the moment, we're getting increased production out of the Congo, and that's causing the spot price to, to roll over in the near term. But longer term, um, the cobalt market remains extremely tight, and longer term, there are significant question marks about the stability of the Congonese government and the, and the economic environment to keep producing those uh, cobalt units. And that's, of course, not uh, even touching on this issue of ethical sourcing of cobalt. It, well, indeed, and that is one. Of the, it, do you think that that is something which is going to come in and bite a lot of companies down the road and actually hurt the cobalt price, given those criticisms? Yeah, look, I, we're already seeing a two-tiered cobalt price um, ex-China, so um, already a number of the consumer electronics businesses, and I believe Apple to be one of those, a number of the EV makers and Tesla is a good example, have stipulated that they'll only source uh, their cobalt from reputable uh, or ethical origins. So there's already a twin pricing, a premium product for that cobalt that can be sourced and have a certificate of origin, and a discount product for, for cobalt that doesn't have that. And I think for the, the bigger Western players, that premium cobalt and that, um, uh, that origin is very, very important. Okay, I'm just going to bring up a chart of what's been happening with and This is a chart uh, in our GTV library. It is entitled Cobalt's Crazy Run. If I take it from the beginning of 2016 and have a look at how much we went up to in March when it peaked, I think, or thereabouts, we see a gain of 332%. Subsequently, we have come down considerably from that. Yep. What happens next in your view? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, let me answer the question, but let me preface it by saying, you've got to remember cobalt's a very, very small market. The entire uh, annual metal volumes today are just over 100,000 tonne. Now, if you compare that to other commodities such as iron ore, you could fit the entire cobalt global market in less than one cape-sized bulk carrier, so in less than one ship. Um, in the iron ore terms. So you, you're expanding or your demand is coming from a very, very small fixed production base and hence you get these rather uh, uh, strident style inflationary and price appreciation numbers. More recently, in, in the last six months, we've seen a rollover in the spot price. It's because we've seen tonnage come out of the Congo, which is very predictable. The, the supply side takes years to come in and, the, and we know that was coming for, for a period. But importantly for us, we've just come back from Asia in a series of commercial visits. The longer term forecast for cobalt is still very strong. So there's significant uh, demand growth coming through from particularly from uh, batteries, as you say. And I think the battery makers and the trading houses over the next two or three years will be scrambling for that supply. A lot of talk about a possible supply crunch here. A lot of people talking about that. Do you think those, those concerns are overstated ultimately? Uh, or do you think that they're justified? Look, it's interesting. I have a background in broader commodities and um, every time there's a supply crunch forecast, um, people and society always inevitably works out ways to do without, to thrift that particular commodity or invent something that doesn't need that commodity and does the same job. I think cobalt's going to be the same. It's just another metal. It's subject to a cycle. Um, there is thrifting and alternatives available, but from our view, and we do have, have a very technological view on, on the future of cobalt in batteries, it's very difficult to do so. Yes, you can lean out the amount of cobalt that goes into batteries, but you can't eliminate it. So I think there is an inevitable security supply concern uh, for the market over the next two or three years. But do I think it's going to be a cliff? No, I don't. And I would add, as a potential producer, Spikes like the ones we've seen generally aren't that helpful. Um, we like much more um, non-volatile, much more consistent markets. So it, that brings me nicely on to the next question is, so what price do you at the moment 
foresee on average looking ahead, let's say in the medium term to the end of this year and perhaps part of 2019? Look, I, I think, and, and, I'll, and I'll quote US dollars per pound, because uh, I'm a little bit old-fashioned that way, but I think a, a $30 um, spot price over the next one or two years is, is quite appropriate as a clearance price in the market. And as I said, that'll be a price that dominates the next 24 months as this um, Congolese metal hits the market. But longer term, I think there's, there's room for upside risk on those numbers. Um, and that's well, a number that if, if allows we... a, a new entrant like Cobalt Blue a, a, a fantastic margin. Absolutely. And with that in mind, we do get a lot of Congolese supply coming on. But you have an advantage, don't you, because you are producing in New South Wales and, and, and therefore people will prefer to come to you, arguably the likes of Tesla, and the, for the reasons I outlined earlier in the interview. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, I think we offer a number of advantages. Um, firstly, the, the sanctity of contract law in, in Africa is something that has perplexed a number of the battery industry for a while, and that's putting it mildly. Um, and I think uh, an Australian jurisdiction is very safe, very dependable. I also think that being a sulphide ore body and not being a laterite is also a large advantage in terms of de-risking um, production for future needs.